Hey, good morning, everyone. Trackman44 here. You know, tell you beat butchering day is coming up uh, really, really shortly, and so we're up here getting the uh, the shop all set up, and so we got the meat table sitting right here, and here's one of one of the multiple boxes, you know, for carrying the packaged meat and everything. You know, that's sitting here. I got to put the tenderizer together yet, and put that on another table. You can see the Hobart meat grinder back in the uh, on the side right there. Then here we got the biro meat saw assembled and got a good blade on it. We're ready to go here. And over on the packaging table we have the uh, the Weston, I think it's a uh, professional grade uh, 2300 15 inch vacuum sealer over there. So we're we're getting uh, geared up and ready to go. We'll have another table set up over here for trimming a little bit of the, the fat and everything for the hamburger. And of course the, the main table is where the main cutting and everything will be. But you know you can't, uh, can't talk about butchering and get ready for butchering without having a few knives laid out. Uh, this a combination of knives is by no means all of them. It's uh, the ones that, that we use primarily uh, over here at my house. Uh, my much older brother's got a much greater, much larger complement of uh, similar items over in his basement because uh, that's where we did all the butchering, you know, for years and years and years. So uh, this is none of what he has over there. He's got, he's got all the good ones over there. I just got all the leftover stuff, you know what I mean? But no, seriously, there's a lot of of handmade knives in here, made by my dad and everything, you know, from the time I was a little kid uh, or a young fella, you know, all the way up until, until he quit making knives, you know. So uh, if you want, we'll uh, spend a few minutes and take a look at it and uh, let me know what you think. Like I say, the old man and the old timers in general uh, were all about function over farm. In other words, you know, they didn't really care what something looked like as long as it was functional and worked and did a fine job farm. Uh, you know, there just wasn't any extra money or any spare money to go out and buy new stuff and have brand new fancy stuff or the best of everything. They made do with what they had. And, you know, my old man was, was uh, exactly the same way. He was born in 1909, lived through the Depression, through some very, very rough times. You know, and, and uh, he was very, very frugal uh, in, in his ways. Never made a lot of money, uh, but, you know, worked his butt off on the farm, you know, his whole life. And brought us guys up doing essentially the same thing. So we learned how to pinch a pinch a nickel, you know what I mean? Until you get something out of the buffalo so you can fertilize the garden, if you know what the old saying is. But anyway, let's take a look at some of the old knives. Just a quick overview before we get started. We got a few skinning knives here, then a few just regular meat cutting knives, a couple of paring knives, bread knives, the newer uh, stainless steel knives, and then actually I got a couple of ceramic knives we're going to bring up tomorrow and try using those ceramic knives. And then also you got the big steak knives, you know, for whenever you're cutting the big steaks and stuff, you know, off of the, uh, and roast off of the beef. And then of course you've got the, your uh, ceramic steel for the stainless steel knives. And I'll bring my diamond hone up tomorrow for, this, for the uh, ceramic ones. And then also your regular steel steel for all the carbon steel knives. And of course the handsaw. Y'all all familiar with all that stuff there. So at any rate, let's go to the very start. When I was in high school, the old man gave me this knife blank. He had used a cold chisel and cut the knife blank out of a crosscut saw. And then I went and finished this up whenever I was in high school. So this would have been 1968 or 1969. And uh, I did not put the date on it. But this is the basic skinning knife design that the old man used all these years. Here's one that he made for me in 1991. You can see it's the same basic design, but just a little bit, just a little bit exaggerated. Just a little larger physically. Uh, and that's one of my favorite ones. This is this is really good for skin. I just absolutely love it. So that was in 91. Here's another one that he made for me in 1986. And that one is really similar to the 1991. He probably used the same pattern for that one right there. Whereas this one here was a much older pattern. And then here's just a regular meat cutter and cutting knife he gave me in uh, uh, 1970. It's just a basic uh, piece of, of um, crosscut saw blade. Here's a new knife. My son-in-law and myself, we went together and, uh, and made two knives identical. We bought knife blanks and we went ahead and just essentially honed the knives to the finish that we wanted and also the edge that we wanted and then made our own handles. I happened to choose walnut for my handle. That was just a couple, three years ago or so. Another meat cutting knife. This was my actual dad's. This is uh, one of his own personal. That's his initials right there, APP, 1963. He had a habit in the later years. Well. He didn't always get his initials on there in the date, but he tried to always to get his initials and the date on there. And he made dozens of these knives. I mean, he made dozens of these knives and gave them away to everybody and his brother over the years. Here's another just basic meat cutting steak knife that he made for me in 1970. Cherry handle. The rivets are handmade rivets. All these have handmade rivets in them. And it's nothing more than large gauge copper wire that he would uh, use to drive through and then brad over, you know, paint them over. 
And here's another one here that uh, is probably the same era, probably in the mid 80s or so. Uh, didn't date this one here, I don't know why, but it's a handy knife. Here's another larger one. He made this one for me in 1985. Just a much larger meat cutting knife. You know, you don't use this at the kitchen table, but you could. You know, you could slice ham or whatever, you know, or you even cut a turkey apart. You don't cut turkey breasts and everything with this if necessary. Here's another one here. This is his own, my dad's own personal knife. It's one of the few of them that I, that I managed to get from him as he got older. But no, again, they're all handmade, all out of crosscut saw blades. Here's another basic knife that he made for my wife in 1985. And I'm really glad that he put the different initials and the years on them. I, that really helps me remember because some of them, like I said, I'm, I'm not totally sure of. Uh, this is just an old hickory. It's a good meat cut knife. You know, got to hit it, you know, hit it a lick or two, you know, every now and then with the steel to keep an edge on it, you know. And here's another one of my dad's old knives. When you're cutting them uh, steaks and everything, you know, off the hind quarters of the beef, some of those steaks are just huge. They're just monstrously round. And we, it's only been in the last, oh, 25 years or so we had a meat saw. They always had to be sawed by hand. So what you do is they would go ahead and, and line this up and they would cut right across the, the bone and then he would turn the knife over backwards like this and then go up over the top and then down to the to the table and go ahead and sever most of that meat off without ever having to go to the other side of the table or roll it around. Then you'd take the hand saw and go ahead and saw through the bone, then go ahead and take the knife and do exactly the same thing all the way across and then drop it off of there. So that's the whole reason why you have these long knives. Now my fingers stretch nine inches, so that near's got a nine and a half inch, nine and a half inch blade. So like I say, that was my dad's own knife. And here's another one of his. This one here is even bigger yet. This got at least a ten and a half inch blade. And it's one of the exact same, uh, for the exact same reason. Now we had a little car knife we had years and years ago. Um, and it was dobbed off on the end. We used to cut the head off of chickens all the time, you know, whenever we'd, uh, <laughs> whenever we'd, um, have chicken dinner, you know, on Sunday afternoons and stuff. But uh, that knife was just all beat up on the back side. The reason being is that old knife they would use whenever we're, we're butchering hogs, instead of sawing down the backbones of the hogs, we get them gutted and ready to have. And of course, they're hung up on a single tree or up on an evener, uh, which is a board with U-bolts in it, with you've got hooks to hook into the legs to spread them open with. Well, you set that big old car knife right up there on that top joint, right near the... Uh, or between the hands, you see what I mean? And you take a hammer and you just pop like that and it just cut right through that first vertebrae and you just go pop, pop, pop all the way down through, just down to the neck and then leave that last little bit of the neck, you know, attached so the, the halves wouldn't go flip-flopping, you know? But that's that was how we used to cut hogs into. Now you don't do that with beef because the vertebrae are much bigger in a beef. It's much more difficult. You have to hand saw those all the way. And I never liked that in the least bit. This one here is a, a handmade out of an old uh, just an old blacksmith file and you can see how old this is and how much it's been been worn down and used and this has actually got some good metal in it but it's handmade but it is not handmade by my dad I fiddled around with making knives whenever I was a kid you know too so in high school this is one I made out of a file I didn't get it worked down nearly as good as what the old man worked them down you know because you know being a kid you know you're impatient you want to get done with it and this is some kind of a composite material I don't even know where we came up with this, but it was some real hard red composite material. And I went ahead and made a different style handle that would fit my grip. My hand's a little bigger now than what it was back then. And of course, this here has got the, the big headed regular uh, uh, rivets that we put through from this side. And then of course, brad the other side over. But this would have been made by me in about 1907, about 1968, 68 or 69. And about that same time, here's another one that I made. I had wild ideas, I guess, you know what I mean? But it's just a, a crazy design, but uh, yeah, it's functional. I don't I haven't used it a whole lot butcher, and it'll go back on the shelf, you know? And then this one here is one that I made, too. I can't remember, but it was after I was out of the Marine Corps, course, so this had to be in the early 1980s. Uh, and I, I, you can see how crude I was with putting my initials on. That didn't do a very good job getting my initials on. But this is a really good knife, and it's about 11 and a half or 12 inch uh, actual cutting edge. Uh, now, we've actually used that a couple times, and it's a good knife, but it's not the best in the world. Here's a, And then we've got a whole pile of store-bought knives. You know, we pick them up at yard sales or farm auctions especially. You know, and a lot of times, believe it or not, 
you'll be talking to people and they'll say, hey, why don't you come by and pick up, you know, grandpa's knife or whatever, you know, uh, we're not ever going to use whatever you need. You need that. And so, you know, you swing by and pick up something, you get something pretty good out of it, you know. And that's, this is one of those right here. This is a store-bought knife. And again, it's a big butcher, meat-cutting butcher's knife. Another similar one too, another store-bought. And I can't recall the story behind every single one of them. I do, for sure, on, on my personal knives, you know what I mean? And this here, just another, this is probably a Forstner. I can't really tell, but I think this is the actual Forstner. And this one here is a fairly new uh, purchase. I probably had this in about 10 or 15 years, and I've not completely worked it down yet, but I will eventually get that worked down with the belt sander, and that'll turn into a pretty good knife. And then here's another one too that's uh, just a store-bought knife, you know, it's not a big deal. And like I say, here's your ceramic, your ceramic uh, sharpening stone. You know, for your stainless steel. You know, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. You see guys go like this, you see guys go like that, and then you see guys that go like this right here. That's actually the, the way I learned how to do it, you know, from watching the old man. You catch it in here on the upswing, and you take it that away and bring it back, go underneath it, catch it the full length on the upswing, and bring it back trying to maintain that specific angle that you want to have on your cutting edge and that angle is about 17 degrees or a little bit less and it's all hit or miss you know but you get into a rhythm but when you're on the movie and you see the guy just slapping that steel on there that's ah, just plum silly but at any rate that's one of the uh, stainless steel knives and here's another pretty good little uh, pretty good little knife the only thing I don't like about this one is so slick where you get a little bit on your handle um, of, of grease or whatever on the handle when you're butchering. Ah, dang it, this thing can't hardly hold on to it. So I usually let the ladies use this one here, um, you know, because they're just cutting or uh, blocking up smaller pieces of hamburger to go into the uh, the grinder. And it is a really good knife for that, but they, they sure messed up with the design of that handle. And I told you the old man made all kinds of different knives. Here's just a, a little bread knife he made. It's got his initials on it again. And this would have been probably in the 50s or 60s, I would think. Uh, just judge it, because I remember this one whenever I was a little, little bitty guy. But that's a homemade one, as well as this one here. This is a typical bread knife that he would make for the kitchen. Whenever we'd set the table in the evening, uh, there'd be two or, three, two or three of these at the different plates around the table. And this is just a bread knife for eating supper. And then, of course, he, he made paring knives. He made knives of all sizes, shape, every kind of, every description you can think of. And then, of course, here's your big steel, your actual steel right here. And it, you work it exactly the same way. You want to go up with a rhythmic pattern. And if you notice, it's got this little star down here. That's to keep you from <laughs> cutting into your, your fingernails. But anyway, whenever you're in the, whenever you're butchering, you just pick the knife up, you know, kind of wipe it off on your apron. You know, come on over and just kind of go like this right here. Want a nice, easy, you don't want to slap it on there. Just like that right there, and you got a, a pretty good edge on it. But you do this a little more frequently than you think is necessary because there's nothing worse than trying to cut meat, number one, cut meat with an uh, extremely dull knife. And there's nothing worse than trying to take a knife that's exceptionally dull and try to touch it back up and get it sharp again quickly. You know, you got to take your time and do it slowly. You know, so the best thing is to just touch it up, you know, whenever you need to. Again. And then, of course, you got your hand meat saw. Even though we've got the electric meat saw here behind me, the biro, there's still always something on the table. Uh, there's always a breast boner. There's always something that needs to be cut the rest of the way through uh, because you don't want to have to pick the whole quarter over and set it on, the, on, the, uh, on the, the band saw. So you always keep a meat saw here so you can just take that one or two uh, cuts that you're going to have due per quarter. And usually it's on a front quarter. Oh, yeah, if you see all the way in the back over there, the, the butcher box, there's still a number of a number of store-bought knives over here that we'll have in there as a uh, as a backup. That's about it for the knives that I'm bringing to the table, you know, for the morning. Well, like I said before, you can't talk about butchering or being involved in butchering without uh, without having a complement of knives. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of different knives for all kinds of different things. You don't use these wide blade knives when you're boning. When you're boning, you have to have those long, narrow, long, narrow, skinny knives. Even like this guy right here is actually a little bit too big to get in there really convenient and get up close to the bone and make those nice tight cuts. So there's there's a wide variety of knives that's required to do the things that we do whenever we're butchering. We don't have all the best knives for, for every situation, but we have a good enough complement to get us by. Hopefully I hadn't bored you too awful much by 
talking about all the old nights, but like I said, I felt somebody might be interested in it at least. And you know what? This is Trackman44, and I'm out of here, guys.